Hey everybody, thank you so much for clicking on this video. So I did a tier list video of the best and worst fitness trends of 2021 and everyone really seemed to like it. So we're gonna do it again, but with exercises. So I went on Instagram and I asked you, what are your favorite exercises? What are your least favorite exercises? And today I'm gonna put them, I'm just gonna rank them. <laughs> Keep in mind that all of these are my opinions as a functional strength and conditioning coach. So if your goals are athleticism or hypertrophy, you're probably gonna have a different opinion, but let's jump on in. All right, so we have five, five different categories. Top of the list is functional staple. So this means that no matter who you are, no matter what the population is, I think that you should be working toward doing this exercise because it can help to benefit your daily life. Underneath that is go for it. So this is like, I don't necessarily think that everyone needs to be doing this exercise, but if you enjoy it and it suits your goals, go for it. Next down is take it or leave it. So this is one where it's like, I do them sometimes, I program them sometimes. It's a fine exercise, but I wouldn't make it like the main focus of your training program. Unless again, it serves a purpose for you. Next one down is be careful. So these are exercises that do have a little bit more risk than reward in my opinion. If you enjoy doing them, that's awesome, but like really be careful with your form. And then at the bottom of the list is just please stop. These are exercises that I don't recommend anyone do because I think there are just better alternatives for what you're trying to accomplish. So let's jump in. All right, first one is a goblet squat. I'm gonna put this in functional staple. Goblet squats are one of my favorite squats because they're gonna work on your squat depth, working on your hip and ankle mobility. It's gonna work on your core because you're holding the weight right in the center and you can load it pretty heavy still. A lot of people think that goblet squats are really limiting as far as the weight that you can hold. Again, if you're working for hypertrophy, yeah, but if you're just looking to like improve your squat depth and work on your core strength, I think goblet squat is a great option. Next up is a chest fly. We're gonna put this guy in, go for it. I don't think you need to be laying on a BOSU ball, but this was just the best photo I could find. So my absolute favorite chest exercise is gonna be a push up. But if you have weak wrists or you just don't have the core strength to perform a push up yet, another great alternative is a chest fly. I do love chest flies because they're gonna work you in that frontal plane or side to side. So it's just targeting that chest in a different angle rather than you know a normal chest press. I also like a chest fly because you can put it with another exercise like a bridge, um, a single leg bridge. You can bring the knees up into more of like a dead bug position to target more of the core too. So it's just very versatile. So I would say like, if it suits your training, go for it. Clam shells. This is one I know very well from physical therapy for my hamstring many times. I'm gonna put a clam shell in take it or leave it. Here's why. Is it a solid activation or rehab exercise? Yeah. Are there better things out there if you're not rehabbing your hip, hamstring, glute, etc.? I think so. I think just ask yourself like, why are you doing a clamshell? If you're doing a clamshell to build your butt, it's not gonna work. It's just not enough resistance, right? Also, if you're doing it, like, so when I did it with in physical therapy, we would do like knees in more, but also then like legs straight. So essentially hip flexion or just like hip neutral, I guess. If those hips are in flexion and you're doing abduction or raising the knee up, that's actually more the function of the piriformis rather than the glute. So again, if you're wise to build your glute, but you're doing clamshells, Number one, it's not enough resistance, but number two, if you're doing it from hip flexion, you're actually targeting the piriformis. And I know that people are gonna say like, but I feel it. Feel does not equal function, okay? If the hips are not in hip flexion and you're doing abduction, absolutely, it's gonna be more glute need. Renegade rows. I'm actually gonna put these and take it or leave it. Let me explain. You see these in my programming sometimes, actually less now than you did when I first started coaching. Renegade rows are a great exercise for anti-rotation for your core, so resisting that rotation. I find that with a lot of people, renegade rows can be really hard on the wrists or the hands, so that can kind of be like a deterrent, and there's so many other anti-rotation core exercises you can do. Also, just if we think about like this, like a renegade row, you really can only load it so heavy. So if you're thinking of this like as a back exercise, it's not gonna be super efficient if you can row past like 
15 or 20 pounds. So I think it's like take it or leave it. I do throw it in every once in a while, but I wouldn't say that it's like something everybody needs to do, if that makes sense. Hip thrust. We're going to put hip thrust and go for it. And a lot of people are probably going to be upset that I put it there instead of functional staple. Here's the thing. Hip thrusts are one of the best exercises to build up your glutes. 100% like Absolutely. Remember that I'm coming at this not from a hypertrophy standpoint, but from a functional strength st standpoint. Hip thrusts absolutely have a, a time and a place in a functional training program, especially depending on whatever your goals are. But I'm not putting it in functional staple simply because not everybody has the setup or access to things that can get you a proper hip thrust, if that makes sense. Not everyone has a bench the right size. I don't. When I do hip thrusts at home, I have to use dumbbells, which is really awkward, and I have to do it like on a stability ball because I don't <laughs> a bench that is appropriate for my size. Um, and again, not everybody has access to a proper weight. Like again, I have to use a dumbbell and it's really uncomfortable, so I don't like doing it. Just thinking of like accessibility, we're gonna put it just like in that go for it if you have access and it suits your goals. A single leg deadlift. We know I love these. This is a functional staple. And this is a challenging exercise, but I do think it's very important for everybody to learn how to do. I'm gonna stick to that. So in that single leg deadlift, obviously we're working our hip extension as we come back up. You're obviously not going to be able to load it as heavy as like a more stable deadlift, but that's not really the point of the exercise. The point is instability, like working on your stabilizer. So not only, I mean, she's doing very straight legs, so that's gonna be very hamstring dominant, but not only is it working your hamstring and your glutes, but you're also getting your inner thighs to help stabilize. You are getting your glute med to help stabilize. You are getting your calf, your ankle. We're working on the extent, uh, the, I guess like the spinal extensors, cause we're, you know, keeping that chest nice and open. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff going on here. And if you think about it, especially if you grew up dancing, this is how so many people bend over to pick something up. I don't know about you, but I'm doing like a full arabesque every time. So it's very functional, not only in mimicking what we do in daily life, but also serving the different stabilizing muscles that we need to prevent injury in daily life. Lateral lunge. We know I love these too. This is a functional staple. So guys, lunges are so important because they're gonna mimic what we do every day. We walk, we walk every single day. And we don't always just walk forwards, right? We walk backwards, we walk sideways, we turn while we're walking. So it's really important to practice these things in our training under resistance so that we don't get injured in daily life. I love a lateral lunge because it's also really versatile. You can make it more hip dominant. She's making it more knee dominant by keeping the body upright, but it's going to work you in that frontal plane. And I think it's one of the best exercises you can do to help strengthen your more stable exercises. So let's say you're working on your lateral lunges and you're progressively adding weight. If you go go back and then try to work on something that's a little bit more stable, like just your, I don't know if you're doing barbell rack squats, like you are going to be so much more capable of lifting heavier if you have strength and instability. So anyway, let's move on. Oh, this is an overhead press. Okay. Let's talk about it this way. So this is, I obviously picked a barbell two arm overhead press. I'm going to say for this, take it or leave it. And then I'm gonna tell you what I would do instead. So I've talked about this in my barbell video, but using a barbell for bilateral upper body movements can be a little bit inhibiting, is that a word? Because number one, it does not need, leave room for unilateral training to help even out muscle imbalances and work with any kind of mobility restrictions you might have side to side on your body. But it also just might not be like the best anatomical fit for your body. So that's why I prefer to do this number one with dumbbells. Number two, I'm gonna prefer 99% of the time to overhead press with one weight at a time. So one arm at a time, because this is going to reduce the risk of going into spinal extension or leaning back with the weight when it gets heavier. So if you're doing a barbell overhead press, just like, you know, again, you can like load it pretty heavy. It's fun. Take it or leave it. If this was single arm overhead press, this would be a functional staple. A dead bug. Ew, Googling images for this was traumatizing, so whoever suggested this, I was very upset with you. <laughs> Okay guys, dead bug, functional staple. This is actually one of my favorite, you know, traditional core or abdominal exercises. And part of that is because we're working the abdominals 
more as stabilizers rather than in their actual function of, you know, taking the ribs and the pelvis and bringing them closer together. And I just like this simply because from a functional standpoint, that's what we do all day. Most of us are seated like this all day. So working them in lengthening rather than shortening and working them more from a functional anatomy standpoint, I think is more beneficial for most people. Um, I also love a dead bug because it's very little pressure on the low back and it will take a while for those hip flexors to like really fire and get involved. And you really don't need to be doing it that long anyway if you're doing it slow, controlled, and purposely. Bulgarian split squats. I did a whole video on these already, so definitely check that out. But we're gonna put these in take it or leave it. Again, do I think that every single person needs to be doing Bulgarian split squats? No, I think first you need to master a split squat. Then you need to master a rear elevated split squat. And then if you have mastered those and this actually serves your goals, then go up to a Bulgarian. I just think that so many of the times we see like impressive exercises online, we go, I wanna do that and that looks amazing and, and I'm gonna just jump right in. And we need to start with the foundations and with the basics because that's what's gonna help reduce the risk of injury. Anyway, if you wanna know more about Bulgarians, watch that video. Bicep dips. I'm gonna put these in be careful. So here's the thing with tricep dips, um, especially if you're doing it on a surface like this, you can see you have to slide your butt pretty far forward. This is putting a lot of, I guess, extension on the shoulder and it's gonna put a lot of pressure on that anterior delt. When we hear about shoulder injuries, it's most of the time in the front of that shoulder um, and it's from loading it too heavy. So really when you're trying to target your triceps here, when you're really extended like that, you're getting a lot of that anterior delt and it's just, it's too much weight. Like it, your body weight is too much weight for it to use. Ideally what you would do is slide your bum under the shoulders, but if you're using a surface like this, it's gonna really inhibit your range of motion. So you're getting such like a small contraction on the tricep anyway. So I would just say like, I don't know, be careful, but also this like isn't the most efficient exercise. If you're doing it on like bars and you can go like all the way down like full extension and flexion, that's great, but again, be careful. I would just prefer, if you're trying to target the triceps, do, do push-ups. Best tricep exercise, in my opinion. Single leg bridge. Y'all, this is a functional staple. I do these in almost every single warm-up. They are so beneficial, and if you are doing them again, slow, purposefully, and with really good mind-muscle connection, five on each side, that's all you need. And again, I'm using them as um, like a, in our warm up or activation for the glutes. If you do not have really good pelvic stability or a solid hip extension, I would just put both feet on the floor. This is a Turkish get up. So this is just one part of the Turkish get up. We're gonna put this in, go for it. So again, do I think every single person needs to be working on Turkish get ups? No, cause there's a lot of different moving parts here and it just might not be the fit the best fit for everybody based on their goals and their capabilities. But do I think it's a solid exercise? Absolutely. It's gonna work on your coordination. It's gonna work on not only your, I'm trying to think of the word, like over chest <laughs> strength with an overhead strength. Wow, professional. <sighs> And then obviously it is very functional because we're going from laying down to standing under resistance. So it is something that does like directly correlate to daily life, like going from laying down to standing. So I think it's a great exercise, but if you don't like it, I think there's other exercises you can do. And if it doesn't like fit your goals, don't worry about it. This is a clean, specifically with kettlebells. I'm gonna say go for it. This is a challenging exercise, especially if you're trying to like teach yourself. I actually did a whole video where I worked with my friend Jane, where she taught me like proper form for a lot of different kettlebell exercises. And cleans are fan freak fantastic for building your power in a low impact way. I actually just did a whole video on power training if you wanna check that out. But a lot of people think that power training only means like high impact and by using kettlebells you can work on your power you can work on your strength and you can work on your cardio so cleans are great i would just say like it is a more difficult pattern to learn especially if you're doing kettlebells so go for it but check your form flutter kicks 
Be careful, be careful of your low back, please. I wouldn't say like never do these because you, you can absolutely like do these with proper form and you know, they're gonna target obviously your abdominals, they're gonna target your inner thighs, some quads, but like just be careful, especially with the upper body laying down like that, it's gonna be really hard for that low back not to pop up. Yeah, for me, I'm literally never gonna program them, but um, you know, if you enjoy them, just like really, really be careful. Back to our kettlebells, this is a snatch. Again, go for it. You have proper form, especially with a kettlebell. This can be a really excellent power exercise, but it's gonna be pretty complex. So um, I would start with a dumbbell if you've never done it before. You get the idea. <laughs> Bicep curls. All right, we're gonna put this in go for it. And let me explain why I'm not saying functional staple. So obviously we wanna work the bicep for its function, right? The function of the bicep is elbow flexion. When we think of biceps though, we think a lot of times of this, of like sitting down and then curling curling weights. For me, that's not the most functional way that we can train our biceps. I personally enjoy putting it with other exercises. You'll see me do bicep curls with squats, with lunges. If I am isolating the bicep curl, I'm gonna do it half kneeling so that it really resists the urge to like get the whole body involved and we're really isolating that bicep. And I'm usually gonna do it single side simply because again, we really wanna work on isolating one side of the body and then the other to prevent any kind of muscle imbalances to continue forming. Also by single siding it, you just get a little added core work. So there's a lot of hands moving right there. Chest press, another one, go for it. Like, I mean, like I said with the chest fly, I think a push up is the superior functional exercise. But if you are looking to really build your, you know, chest like max strength or working for hypertrophy, like yeah, chest press is gonna be your bread and butter. I do prefer just like in this photo, dumbbells rather than a barbell. It might fit your, it probably fits your anatomy a little bit better and you're going to resist the urge of using one side of your body more than the other. We have our first please stop, plank hip dips or rainbows or whatever the heck you wanna call these. <sighs> okay, so if you just look at her spine, we are getting a lot of rotation from the low back. Low back is not meant to have have a ton of movement in it. The low back is meant to be sturdy and meant to be your base. So the more that we twist and extend and, and flex and turn and all of these things, especially under resistance, the more that we do that to the low back, the, the more we're raising that risk of injury. So if you have hip dips in your program, I just wanna ask you why. Your why is more than likely to work your obliques, right? There's so many other excellent oblique exercises you can do. Even just looking at this, renegade rows, that's gonna work your obliques from resisting rotation. Single leg bridges, that's gonna work your obliques, again, resisting rotation. Single leg deadlift, that's gonna work your obliques, resisting rotation. So if you're looking to work your obliques, I would prefer you work them in an anti-core movement because it's gonna be a lot safer for the low back. Not that there is never a time and place for rotation, but I do not believe there is a time and place for rotation of the lumbar spine. Editing Justina here. Um, you can also work the obliques in rotation. I didn't mean for it to sound like you can never rotate. It's just about where you're rotating from. So I'm gonna insert a few rotational exercises that are also healthy, safe, and effective for the obliques. kettlebell swing. This is another one, go for it. So really same exact thing that I'm saying about cleans and snatches. I find they're a little bit easier to teach people than a kettlebell clean or snatch. And again, just an excellent, excellent power exercise that is low impact. It's gonna really teach you how to generate power from the hips. Oh God, what is this? I think this is a jump squat. We're gonna, wow, I'm gonna run out of room, I think. <laughs> Okay, jump squat, go for it. So guys, I think that generating power with impact is also important if you can do it. You know, we don't live in a, in a 100% no impact world. So I, I think that taking all impact out of our training can be really silly unless you have some kind of situation where you absolutely cannot. Mountain climbers. Woo! 
kind of take it or leave it. I put these in programming sometimes, more in like our endurance months. You know, it, it's one of those things where like, are there better exercises? Yeah. But if I'm teaching group fitness, do I know that everyone knows what a mountain climber is really quickly? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like an easy thing to program that I don't see a huge issue with. But if you don't like them, there's so many other plank variations that you can do instead. Russian twist. Do we know what I'm gonna say? Please stop. Same exact reason as our hip dip. So you can see not only are we getting a lot of lumbar rotation here, we're also weighting it. And then half the time I see people with their feet up off the floor, it is just like recipe for disaster. And then you see people doing like 50 reps of them. It's way too much. You can do a Russian twist safely. And this, the twist comes from the thoracic spine or the mid back. I just don't see a lot of people doing that. And that's why I just like, I don't program them. There's so many other exercises you can do. If you're looking to get a twisting exercise, do bicycle crunches. Great exercise right there. All right, we're making our way downtown, walking fast. Here we go. An RDL or a Romanian deadlift or more of like a straight leg deadlift. This is a functional staple. So this is going to be like the, the regression of this, the single leg deadlift. Honestly, just great exercise because we need hip dominant motions in our life. And so many times we see that programming is knee dominant. So more squats and lunges rather than hip hinging motions. As a society, we tend to be a little bit weaker a lot of times in our hamstrings and glutes. So this really helps support our daily function. A plank. I want you to let me know in the comments what's wrong with this person's form. Like who didn't correct this? All right, a plank, functional staple. For anybody who says that they don't like planks, there are absolutely other exercises, but I would urge you to figure out why you don't like planks. And if it's just because they're hard, tough love. Like you should be doing them. It is one of the best core exercises. And you honestly, if you're doing it right, you don't have to do it long. Like 30 seconds is all you need in any plank variation. If you have somebody telling you that you need to be doing like three minutes of planks, that they're wrong. <laughs> because at that point, you're not even working your core anymore. Like you're just working your shoulders, you know? So what I do a lot of times with my clients, we hold a plank and we don't hold it for seconds. We actually hold it for breaths. So I'll usually just do five breaths. That usually equals about 30 seconds, but it's gonna give you so much more connection with your core, which is the why of doing a plank. So learn to love your planks, people. Skaters, we know I love these. I'm gonna say go for it. Again, we're working in that, that frontal plane side to side. We're getting a lot of power and then deceleration, especially if you're doing these, you know, we have skaters, which are more continuous. And then we have a lateral bound, which is like a jump hold. So that's gonna work a lot more of our deceleration, but it's important for your stability, your ankle health, your power. The only reason I'm not saying functional staple is because again, some people can't do impact for whatever reason. So if you can do these, that's awesome. And I think that you should, but if not, don't stress about it. A split squat. This is a functional staple. So a split squat is gonna be different from a front or reverse lunge because your feet stay static on the ground. Whereas with a lunge, you are stepping or lunging. But split squats are a great way to improve your squatting strength. If you found that like you're kind of stuck at whatever weight that you're squatting at, if you isolate one side of the body and then the other for a few weeks, and then you go back to your normal squat, you are gonna realize that you can now actually lift more. And then all of the other reasons of unilateral training, like we're evening up muscle imbalances, yada, 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 all that good stuff. Push-ups, functional staple, best chest exercise, best tricep exercise, one of the best core exercises. I firmly believe that every single per person should learn how to do a push-up. Bear crawls is a functional staple. Guys, I think that understanding, again, how to hold yourself up in, a, up in a plank and then move the plank is so important. Like it's mind body connection, it is core, it's coordination. I love a bear plank and a bear crawl, whether it's forward, backwards, sideways. That's why you see them so much in my training. All right, last one. Look at this, I'm actually really proud of this photo that I found. This is a burpee and we all know what I'm gonna say. We saved, um, we saved this one for last. Please stop. I have a whole video on burpees and why I think they are pointless, but essentially to break it down, a burpee is like six different exercises, right? Unless you have perfected every single one of those six exercises, you have no reason to be doing a burpee. Like if you don't have a good jump squat, why are you doing a burpee? If you don't have a good push up, why are you doing a burpee? If you don't have the hip or ankle mobility to jump your feet forward into that like frogger position to stand back up, why are you doing a burpee? So 
keep it simpler, perfect those individual exercises first. And then if you really love burpees, go for it. But honestly, like I find that most people just program burpees because they want you to sweat and that's not a reason to train. So unless your goal is just to like learn how to sweat as much as possible, then add in burpees. Whew. All right. That was a lot. We're running low on battery. A lot of talking. Hopefully you guys found that interesting and informative. Let me know if there's any other exercises that you would like an opinion on from a functional standpoint. But as always, remember that if you enjoy a movement and it suits your goals and it gets you stronger, do that. Any questions, leave them down below and I will see you all in the next one.